Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. My name is Carrie Mulkowski, National Program Senior, Senior Manager at FAIR, and I am going to be your moderator for today's presentation. Today, we'll be talking about summer camps. Whether they are designed specifically for children with food allergies or they welcome campers with food allergies, they really are something that every child, including those with food allergies, should have the chance to experience. I'd like to briefly say, just state up front, that FAIR does not certify, review, or accredit camps. Um, parents should complete a thorough and independent review of a camp's practices and procedures to ensure their safety and capacity to accommodate a child with food allergies. All right, so we have with us today three expert speakers, Gina Klaus, Eleanor Guerra Holding, and Sandy Rubenstein, who will be providing different perspectives and guidance on how attending summer camp with food allergies, whether that be a day camp or a sleepaway camp, um, it really is something that's doable and can be a wonderful experience for your child. So I'd like to take a brief moment and introduce each of our presenters because they come from different backgrounds with a wealth of different knowledge and information. Um, first up, we have Gina Klaus. Gina is the National Director of Training for FAIR and former Program Director for a CDC initiative where she developed educational tools and trained on the national guidelines for food allergy management in schools. She also participated in the development of her state guidelines for managing food allergies in schools in Pennsylvania. And she currently serves on an international panel developing evidence-based global guidelines for food allergy management in schools. She's a well-known trainer and coach, and her advice has appeared in numerous print, radio, and television features, including CNN, People Magazine, and ABC World News. She is also a columnist for Allergic Living Magazine and author of the best-selling children's book, One of the Gang, Nurturing the Souls of Children with Food Allergies. In addition to Gina, we have with us Eleanor Guerra Holding. Eleanor has worked, educated, and advocated in the food allergy community for 15 years. She was inspired to start this work after her son, Thomas, was diagnosed with life-threatening food allergies to tree nut, peanut, wheat, and sesame, eosinophilic esophagitis triggered by milk and wheat, asthma, and environmental allergies. As the CEO of the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis Connection Team, Eleanor provides leadership, development, and implementation for all of FAC's initiatives and programs, including Camp TAG, the Allergy Gang which is a summer camp for children with food allergies and their siblings that Eleanor founded in 2009. Eleanor has a Bachelor of Healthcare Administration degree from Lewis University in Illinois and worked in hospital management for 16 years in Chicago and suburban Chicago prior to working in the nonprofit sector. Um, last but not least, we have Sandy Rubenstein. Sandy was born and raised in the suburbs of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and moved to Cape Cod in 2004. Sandy received her Bachelor of Science in Cinema and Photography from Ithaca College in 1995. Following graduation, Sandy moved to Hollywood to work as an agent's assistant at Gold Marshak Lidke, a talent and literary agency. After two years in Tinseltown, Sandy followed her heart and moved to Baltimore, Maryland to marry her college sweetheart. In Baltimore, she worked in marketing and public relations, promoting brands such as Old Bay, Planned Parenthood, Baltimore Raven Stadium, and McDonald's. In 2000, Sandy and her husband, Will, who were both lifelong campers and counselors, decided to follow their dream to own a summer camp. They spent the next four years working for various camps, obtaining directing, experiencing, experiencing networking, searching, and searching for their own camp. In 2004, their dream became a reality when Sandy and Will purchased Camp Wingate Kirkland, a co-ed residential camp founded by the Wolfson and Silverman families in 1957. Along with their daughters, Mia and Sarah, two dogs, 12 hens, a teacup pig, Sandy and Will live and work at Camp Wingate Kirkland full time. Um, we are so lucky to have this panel of speakers here with us today. And at this time, I am delighted to turn the presentation over to Gina Klaus, who is going to get us started for the day. So Gina, one second, and I will give you the reins. Okay, there you go. So good morning, everyone. Carrie, it's always a pleasure to be doing another webinar with you. And Eleanor and Sandy, we're so happy to have you with us here today. 
Thank you. So where to start? Food allergies, for the most part, are an invisible threat. Our kids look perfectly adorable and healthy, and others can't see their invisible vulnerability. They can't possibly imagine how things can change dramatically in a matter of seconds or minutes when a reaction hits. And when we work with others as parents to find out if they're capable of caring for our children, their level of understanding of food allergies is invisible. We can't really know for sure. Everyone will say that they handle food allergies well, but often they don't. So we can't just go by what they say or what they write. We need to look beyond that to what they actually do. When my son Daniel was in grade school, and he's got multiple food allergies years ago, I was looking into a camp for him. And I went to a couple of local camps, one at a nearby facility where I exercised. So I was able to observe outside how they were handling the kids. And I observed as they were serving a snack and as they were doing an activity, the kids were really unsupervised. And they had kids as young as three or four. And they were running all around. And people were coming in and out of the building to exercise. I looked at that and thought, oh my goodness, they could, someone could easily just, you know, lure one of these children away. And then when they were eating their snack, you know, these teenagers who were kind of running the show were not really paying attention. So I thought, well, definitely that camp was not for us. And the following year, the director of that camp hired me to do food allergy training. She was really quite shaken. They had had a very serious reaction with a child who required hospitalization after an allergic reaction. They gave the child trail mix and it had a warning that it may contain um, peanuts and tree nuts and the child was allergic and she had a pretty serious reaction. So I had been training for many years by that point and I went to train their camp counselors and their staff and I felt pretty skilled and confident about getting people's attention and really highlighting the reality of food allergies and the danger. But these kids were not having it. Probably a fourth of the crowd was just completely checked out they were primarily very young teens. Some of them were staring at their phones. Some of them were actively texting while I was talking. A few of them had their eyes closed and they looked like they were sleeping. So I talked to the director again after that and really gave her a warning that I was very worried about that camp. And I ended up crossing it off my list for my own son from that time after. So you're going to want to verify everything. And before you even reach out to a camp, it's smart to have some idea about what you might need. For example, do you want your child to self-carry their epinephrine auto injector? That would be like an OBQ or an EpiPen. There's a few different brands on the market. Or do you need to have it with an adult who's capable of administering who will be with your child? What are their emergency procedures? Who at the camp is trained to use the epinephrine auto injectors? Where are they kept? How is the staff trained, not only just to handle an emergency, but to avoid an allergic reaction? And among those who are trained to administer medication and recognize a reaction, will they be in the vicinity of your child? So those are just a few questions that you want to think about. Emergency response is one thing, but there's a lot more. So the cornerstone of food allergy management is avoiding, recognizing, and responding to allergic reactions. And they're all equally important. When you think about avoidance, you need to cover all the potential areas where a child could ingest or be exposed to a food allergy, especially in light of the child's individual sensitivity. You want to look at all the areas that may pose a risk for your child. And what will be safe or appropriate and what level of precaution is needed will depend on the child's age, maturity level, allergies, and the severity. So for example, a child who is 17 years old and allergic to, let's say, peaches and wheat, that individual may have no problem with these foods being served or eating right next to them at the same table, as long as his food has been prepared safely and there's no cross-contamination. On the other hand, let's say an example is a four-year-old who's severely allergic to milk and those cheesy corn curl snacks are being served to a bunch of messy and tactile young preschoolers. So this is a different scenario and this is likely not safe. And also with younger kids, we have to think about their impulsivity, their you know, we socialize them to share, and often even when we ingrain in their minds, like, no, you, you can't eat anyone else's food, someone offers them something to eat, and they may take it. There was a very young girl, Amaria Johnson, who, it was a school situation, but um, she passed away from a severe allergic reaction. And her grandparents, when they were interviewed, they said, oh, she would never, never not eat any, she would never eat anything without knowing the ingredients. And being a young child, 
She was given a peanut on the playground, reportedly, and she ate it. You know, these are young kids. They're, that's why they're not on their own, right? They still require that scaffolding and that support and that supervision from adults. My own son, when he was very young, I had trained him from a very young age, and he has multiple food allergies, that he's never to eat anything without asking someone. And I overheard him at a party when he was about four. He asked his two-year-old cousin, I think she was two and a half, he, he, he wanted to eat potato chips. And he said, hey, do these have peanuts in them? So, But he was asking a two-year-old. Of course, she said no, but what she didn't know. So he had no idea. So they definitely need that adult, that high level of adult supervision, especially when they're younger. So meals and snacks are one of the things that really come to mind when people think about camp. And it's a very important aspect, although it's not the only one. There, are, there is really so much to managing food allergies in the serving and eating and storing food. So there's the buying the food, there's understanding labeling, which is really complex and nuanced. So everything about that has to be understood. You know, little things that I've come across over the years, the one example that always came to mind that caused a reaction was, Oreo, the brand name Oreos happened to be a safe snack for one child. And another parent, you know, innocently, well-meaningly, bought what she thought were Oreos, but they were a store brand, Oreo light cookie, but they had a different ingredients, and one of them was an allergen to the other child. So just not even understanding that an Oreo is not just a sandwich cookie, that's a particular brand name, all of that is really important. Beyond buying the food, there, how is the food stored? You want to think about what shelf, you know, what containers. Is the container completely safe? You know, is there a chance that there's cross-contamination, for example, from wheat or gluten with other flours? How are you preparing the food? It's not just the main ingredients. It's cross-contact. Did you make sure? I remember early when my son was first diagnosed just making marinara sauce and just I used to use butter and olive oil and onions and garlic and my son was allergic to milk he can have it now as a teenager which is great knock on wood but um I accident I was making two pots of sauce one for my son with just olive oil and no dairy and the other one and I accidentally stirred it with the wrong spoon it's really and you know this is me I'm a mother I'm completely devoted but mistakes can so easily happen and cross contact is really something that needs to be in the forefront of anyone's mind who's preparing food for someone with food allergies or special dietary needs. And then there's the serving of the food. You know, I can think of another example where we were at a very allergy-friendly amusement park staying there for vacation one time. The chef came out and took our order. Everything was, we felt so confident. Yes, they would make it, you know, they would make my son a hamburger. Everything would be fine. They would make him these French fries. Everything would be fine. And then and they, when they brought it out, it had one of those metal containers over it. They had a little allergy pick in there, but they had a little tiny garlic of, or a garnish of a little bit of fruit, cantaloupe and some grapes and straw. And my son was allergic to melon. And I could just see a little bit of a dribble from the melon on the plate. And I just said, no, we can't. So even the serving of food is really important. And then, of course, storing food. If there are leftovers or if safe food has been prepared for an allergic child, how is that stored? How is that label after going to all the trouble or the effort to make a safe meal or snack? We want to make sure that it's stored accurately, that it's safe, that no one else is digging into that. So exposure to allergens can happen in a number of areas. So you want to think about camps and you really want to dig in and understand what types of activities are going to be done so that you can anticipate any potential risk. So, you know, camps can do a certain amount to accommodate, but, you know, if you're thinking about fishing, latex in sports and activities, will there be snacks taken out away from the main camp? You think about venom, you know, bee sting and wasp sting allergies. Some children can actually react to even cold water, swimming sometimes. Sunscreens can cause reactions. Um, children often can get uh, hives from heat. And then, of course, there's exercise-induced anaphylaxis. So you want to be aware of these things, especially because these activities may be something outside of the norm, and your child may not have been exposed to them before. So you want to think about this. When my son was very young, he did an activity. He was able to play with Play-Doh. He is allergic to wheat, but he had no issues with Play-Doh, and his allergist said that was fine for him to continue. He did not have contact reactions. So I was asked if they could do a craft with a, a wheat table where they were going to measure and play with the wheat at a table. And that seemed fine to me because I knew my son could touch wheat. Well, he had pretty, pretty 
uh, noticeable reaction. And the doctor later said probably the, the wheat getting into the air, it got into his eyes. He may have rubbed his eyes. He may have you know put some wheat into his mouth. We don't know for sure. He was okay. But I was really surprised by the level of reaction because he had played with Play-Doh so many other times. So you really want to think carefully about events outside the norm that your child hasn't been exposed to previously. And then, of course, a lot of us think about the, the arts and crafts. You know, are there arts and crafts with noodles or beans? Are we using egg cartons? What's in the paint? There can be egg or other milk ingredients in paints. Play-Doh, as I just mentioned, has weed. Face painting can sometimes cause a reaction in kids who are have sensitive skin or eczema. There's lots of potential for exposure to allergens in these ingredients. I was, um, a, a mom emailed me recently, and I was really surprised by this. Her daughter has a severe milk allergy, and after, I believe it was a soccer season, they had a very successful soccer season, and all of the coaches and the assistant coaches went, the, the team was all lined up after to celebrate, and all of a sudden, these coaches and assistant coaches and backup staff come with these whipped cream pies, and they put them in all the kids' faces. And this mother, she said she just heard her daughter like, no, but they got her. She was okay. She closed her mouth. And, but it was unbelievable. Like we really have to think through it's 2019. And at this point with one in 13 kids, at least having at least one food allergy, we have to think carefully about how we, how we do deal with food, even if it's not directly ingested. And then just another example that's a classic for camps is the campfires. We know that s'mores, there are certain foods that are, have a higher risk of cross-contamination with allergens. Chocolate happens to be one of them. You know, they tested a lot of dark chocolate, and even if milk was not an ingredient, it was actually contained in a, a very high, alarming percentage of chocolate that shouldn't contain milk, and that where it wasn't listed as an ingredient. And in many cases, it wasn't even listed as a, you know, a potential threat, like a may contain or processed in a facility. Uh, chocolate is easily cross-contaminated with nuts and peanuts as well, so that's just something to keep in mind. And campfires, in general, can be a risk for those with asthma. And also, keep confusing asthma with an allergic reaction is another issue. It, we want to make it really clear to camp staff the difference between an asthma reaction and an anaphylactic reaction. In the event that there is confusion, epinephrine, the drug of choice for anaphylaxis, can be used to help with an asthmatic reaction, but the opposite is not true. Using asthma drugs to treat anaphylaxis won't really help, and it's very dangerous. So anaphylaxis is a potentially life-threatening allergic reaction, and it's really important that caregivers and supervisors know the signs. Once anaphylaxis is known or suspected, epinephrine is the answer. And epinephrine is the drug that comes in an obicure. You may know it as an EpiPen, and there are a few other brands on the market today. It's a form of adrenaline. So if you give it and it wasn't truly needed, it'll just be like a whoosh of adrenaline that comes through your body, and it will be okay for the child. But if it's really needed and you don't give it, the consequences can be very dire. And there's a point where the allergic reaction will progress so far that the epinephrine can't catch up to the reaction. So time really matters in this case. And individual plants are important because although with anaphylaxis, as I said, epinephrine it should be used for anaphylaxis. However, some children may have such a severe sensitivity or a history of such a severe reaction that their instructions from their doctor on when to medicate may require a caregiver to use the epinephrine even with mild symptoms or even just if they've been exposed. So you really want to make sure that you have those specific instructions from the caregiver, from the medical professional, so you know when and how to administer epinephrine because it may, you may need to be a little bit more aggressive with treatment for certain individuals. And adult supervision is another really important thing. As I mentioned before, young children are impulsive. They can take different risks they may not understand, and they may not be able to carry their epinephrine. So you want to make sure that there's always someone nearby who is trained to recognize and treat an allergic reaction. You want to know about when to administer that epinephrine, what that would look like, what it, how a child might re describe a reaction, because that can be very different than how an adult would. So, you know, the child 
my mouth is burning, I feel something stuck in my throat, they may think that they're actually choking on something. So you really need to be aware of how a child might describe that. And also some of the other risks. So it's ingestion, of course, causes most severe fatal and non-fatal reactions, but you also, there are other routes of exposure. So we do want to be aware of cooking and campfires and other ways that a child might be exposed or have an allergic reaction. So the other things to think about is in every situation, when I work with parents to develop a plan for school, we talk about every month of the school year, we talk about every week, different things, different holidays, and then we look at the school day, like how is the child transported to school, what are the risks there? When they first come in, when all the children come into the classroom, during snack, during specials, during gym, during uh, lunchtime, you know, what happens after lunchtime, what happens on the ride home. You want to look at all these different situations. And you want to do the same thing for camp. So what are mornings like? What are afternoons like? What about nighttime? Where does the child go? Who's in charge during the day? How is a reaction handled at night? Who 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 would call who would administer the epinephrine? Who would call nine one one? How would they be transported? Does the ambulance or EMS do they carry epinephrine? Is there any sp particular script you should use? Step by step, you want to have that spelled out, and hopefully you never have to use it, but you will feel better and they will be better prepared if you have that set up. My policy with my son Daniel over the years has always been it's not if he can do something, but how. So how, could, how can your child go to camp? How can you find a camp where they'll take good care of your son? Can you? Yes, you can. But it may require, for example, that you travel to a different state. It may require, like in my son's case, we tried a different kind of camp. It may require that he or she do a day camp for a while rather than an overnight camp, at least for now. Or it may be that you handle things like my friend Jill did. Jill is an attorney and a parent of a food allergic daughter. And she investigated a whole lot of camps. She wanted her daughter to attend a sleepover camp, as she had done as a child. And she wanted to find one that both her food allergic daughter and her son could attend. And she investigated and investigated, and she felt comfortable with no, none of them. So she found one that was the most cooperative, and she pitched herself as a food allergy consultant. And she learned how to order all of the food and supervise the cooking and train the staff and order snacks and, and meals and for years at that camp. So her daughter and her son were able to attend the sleepaway camp for many years and it was safe for them. And she also learned how to supervise and tend to the other children who had special dietary needs. And as you can imagine, the camp became very popular with that crowd. And now that her children are older and going to college, they're not attending that camp any longer, but she has made that camp safe for food allergic children and children with special dietary needs for many, many years to come. So for your child to attend camp, you know, a lot of camps are all over the place in terms of their understanding. So the training may be on you. And you wanna be careful, unlike schools in my experience, Parents seem to know that with schools, they need to establish a safety plan, some type of an accommodation plan or a food allergy management plan. But sometimes with camps, and maybe because it's for just for a week or a few days or just for afternoons, they're sometimes lulled into this false sense of comfort, maybe because it's a fun activity. And you don't want to go into a situation and just blindly trust. You want to trust, but you want to verify. And if things aren't up to par with the camp, then you work with them till they are like Jill or you move on. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you, Gina. Um, you provided just so many helpful tips about um, what parents should know and what they can do to prepare for camp. And the many, it sounds like many, many questions they really do need to keep in mind when thinking about um, sending their little ones or their teenagers away. And we actually will get um, we'll be able to ask our expert camp representatives some of those questions and hear their thoughts and kind of hear how they accommodate food allergy, food allergies at their camps. Um, but first, I'd like to give each of them an opportunity to just provide a brief overview of their camps um, and also tell us a little bit about how and why they got into the business of accommodating food allergies at camp. So first, I'd like to turn our attention to Camp Tag, the allergy gang, and its founder, Eleanor. 
Um, Eleanor, you have the floor. Please let us know um, about Camp Tag. I think there are three different locations this year. Um, and just anything you want to tell us about how you maybe got into this. So please take it away. Sure. Thanks, Carrie, and thanks, Gina, for having me. I appreciate the time sure. today and glad to be part of this webinar. So Camp Tag, the Allergy Gang, we are going into our ninth summer, and we do have three locations this year in Ohio, Nashville, Tennessee, and New York. So we're excited to have three locations this summer. But the reason I got into this type of planning with camp was because of my son Thomas as you had mentioned earlier he's now 16 and has food allergies to all tree nuts peanut and sesame and eosinophilic esophagitis and asthma along with some environmental allergies but when he was probably almost four years old I was looking to take him to a day camp in the Chicagoland area where we are from and I could not find a camp, day camp, that would accommodate him. They were either afraid of the epinephrine auto-injector or they couldn't guarantee that his allergens would not be present or there would be no cross-contact. And so even after offering training and education, the different camps I had reached out to were not going to be a fit for us. And so I really wanted him to have that camp experience along with my daughter who's 14 and has no food allergies at all. Um, and that picture on the left, the shorter of the two teenage boys, that's my son Thomas, that was last summer at our New Jersey camp. But um, after realizing that I wasn't going to be able to really find a camp in our area, I did a lot of research across the country looking for specialized day camps with children with food allergies, and I was not able to find any specialized day camps at that time. And again, this was like about 12 years ago. And so at that point, I conducted a nationwide survey for a specialized day camp if I were to start one. And I had over 3,000 responses from across the country all saying yes to Camp Tag. And so a few years later, I was able to launch Camp Tag uh, in New Jersey. And uh, I've been in other states as well, but we really have been in Ohio now and New Jersey mainly, and now Nashville and New York. So always looking to expand and add locations, but I really wanted my kids to have the camp experience together because siblings are just as affected, and we include siblings in everything that we do with camp and other events. And we also have seen over the years that there's uh, so many other conditions that go hand in hand. Thomas also has the eosinophilic esophagitis and asthma, and so we allow children to come with those conditions as well as celiac disease and f pies uh, because we do see a lot of those conditions go hand in hand along with the non-allergic siblings. And so Camp Tag is for ages 4 to 13 and then teens 14 on up as long as they have one of those conditions or a sibling they can serve as volunteer teen counselors for the week and receive community service hours for their time which they all love to do for school and uh, to put on their high school resumes and college resumes applications so it's really great that they want to be involved and continue on as volunteers and receive community service hours for their time. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. I love hearing your story, and I love the sibling aspect of it, you know, and then it wasn't just your your want or need to have Thomas have a safe and fun camp, but also your daughter as well. So I think that's so special, um, and I love what you're doing and, and hope that it grows even beyond three camps. So thank you so much for telling us a little bit about Camp Tag. Um, next up, we have Sandy Rubenstein, who, along with her husband, own and, owns and directs Camp Wingate Kirkland, um, a camp in Massachusetts. So, Sandy, you have the floor. Please tell us, you know, how you got into this. I loved reading your bio. It was so unique. And just to, to see your journey and how you ended up here and 
to hear about your teacup pig. So please, anything you want to share, um, let us know. Thank you very much. Um, so Camp Bunky Kirkland is a co-ed overnight and day camp in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Uh, we serve kids um, ages four to 15. Um, our, the, the camp has been in existence since 1957 and my husband and I have owned it for the last 16 years. Um, when we bought the camp, um, we uh, five days before our first summer of owning camp, we had our first child. And uh, one of the campers in our community had, a, had an allergy to peanuts um, went to make a phone call home to his mom and, and the child before him had had a peanut butter sandwich and the child had a reaction. And we realized that we needed to make a new change to our community at camp so that we could accommodate um, and make a safe place for kids with food allergies. But one of the most important things that we get Kirkland is teaching kindness and compassion, um, teaching kids how to empathize and in a growing world, in a world where there's so much hate and discrimination, we felt it was our um, charge and our mission to teach kids how to empathize and to advocate for their friends who have food allergies. So in our first summer, we became completely peanut, tree nut, and sesame free. And we built a kitchen inside of our dining hall specifically so that we could accommodate children with all food allergies. Um, so we're able to com accommodate, you know, the, any food allergies and make kids feel like they're not living, I'm the child who has food allergies, but rather feel the same sense of security and safety that they do in their own home, um, knowing that they can relax because the chef and I are reading, carefully reading every label the same way that their parents would at home. Um, so in the last 16 years, we've had dozens of kids come through camp with a variety of food allergies that we've successfully been able to accommodate um, and created a safe place for them where they can just be themselves, they can create their own sort of self-discovery and not have to focus um, and not be that defined by their food allergies. I love that. I love that so much. I love that you've created a safe place where they can feel included and really unique, but not unique because they have a food allergy. Unique for all of their wonderful, you know, individual hidden talents that I'm sure they all have. So thanks so much, you know, for to you and your husband and your family for putting that effort in and creating such a safe place. Um, okay, awesome. Thank you both. It was really neat to hear a little bit about um, the background behind both your camps. Um, you're really making a difference by making camp a possibility for so many families out there that, you know, may have thought otherwise. So um, thank you for being here with us today and sharing a little bit about your camps. We are going to move on and uh, take some time to ask these experts, Gina, Eleanor, and Sandy, some of the most popular questions that we receive at FAIR um, from members of the food allergy community in regards to um, just attending summer camp with food allergies, again, whether that's a day camp or a sleepaway camp. And, and I think Gina let, maybe led with this um, for her part of the presentation, but food allergy reactions and anaphylaxis is, I think, at the top of, of the um, parents and caregivers' minds when they're thinking about sending their child to camp. Um, so I'd like to just start off and ask a couple questions around anaphylaxis, and you guys can let me know um, how things are done at your camp. And Sandy, we'll, we'll kick this off and start with you, and then Eleanor, please chime in um, after. Um, so the, one of the first questions is, and the most popular one is, um, so who at camp is trained to recognize anaphylaxis and administer epinephrine auto-injectors? And then just a second part to that question, um, are these individuals trained on all different models of the injectors or just one? Um, so can you speak a little bit to that? Um, so we, um, we train the entire staff. We have 90 people on our staff and we feel that it's important um, in, we feel that everybody should know how to use an auto injector and we do cross train on all of the different um, devices that deliver epinephrine. Um, AviQ, the generic brands, Mylan, we're able to collect um, trainers for as many as possible um, so that we're prepared in any case. Um, 
in our short time, we've only had to do it twice. And um, both times were parents who didn't prepare themselves and went out of camp and ate seafood. Um, but it was our nurse that actually delivered the EpiPen. So we haven't had a situation, this was just carelessness from parents who weren't prepared on their own. Um, but um, we feel everybody should know how to do it. Everybody should know the signs um, and that our nursing staff and our medical staff are prepared as well. Great, Eleanor, would you like to answer as well? Yes, for Camp TAG, our staff, along with all the teen counselors are educated and trained on the signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis and how to recognize anaphylaxis. And they are all trained on how to administer an epinephrine auto injector. And at Camp TAG, we do have campers with AviQ, the EpiPen, and the EpiPen generic. And we also, at all camp sites, they have a uh, full-time nursing staff with two to three nurses full-time at all three sites. So we do have a medical team there as well that are trained and educated on signs and symptoms of anaphylaxis and how to administer epinephrine. Um, medication for our campers as well is to be brought with them every single morning and then it's checked out with them every afternoon when they leave with their parents. We don't allow medication overnight just with it being a day camp and we wanna make sure they have their medication with them at all times, which their medication is with them throughout the entire day with their teen counselors and staff on site. So they are never within two feet from their medication. So it's with them at all times, whether it's their epinephrine auto injector, their asthma inhaler, or any other type of medication they may need. Wonderful. You actually answered my follow-up question. So I'll ask um, Sandy at Camp Wingate, can campers also, um, is their medication close by or can they self-carry their auto injectors? How do you guys handle that? Um, they, I, I, yes, sorry. Um, everybody can. Everyone can self-carry, so we ask, uh, because we're residential, we ask for multiple auto-injectors to be delivered with the campers when they're coming at the beginning of their stay. Um, so some choose to have it with them on at all times. There's one um, in their bunk where they live. There's also multiple in the health center, um, in the dining hall, in the office. So we place them all over camp um, strategically in case of an emergency. Um, and, and as well, because we stock additional epi EpiPens or auto injectors, you know, in case of other emergencies for kids who may not know that they have anaphylaxis. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, thank you both. So, um, Eleanor, we'll start with you this time. At Camp Tag, how far, and I know you have different locations, but in general, how far um, are you from emergency care? Like, how close is the ER? Is that something you take in consideration where you're picking these locations? Yes. And all of that information is on our website for every location as well, all the nearby hospitals. So the response time for EMS to arrive to each of the campsites is five to eight minutes. And then the hospitals are within 20 to 30 minutes of each of the camp locations uh, based on where we are in the different cities and areas. Wonderful, and thank knock you. On wood, knock on wood, going into our ninth year, we've never had an anaphylactic reaction at camp. We've had cuts and bruises, but that's about it. Thank goodness. <laughs> Good. We will hope for the same for the 2019 season for sure. Yeah. Um, and Sandy, what about Camp Wingate? Are you guys nearby an ER or emergency care? Um, yes. Camp, uh, Cape Cod Hospital is about four miles away from camp, and our uh, emergency response is about four, four minutes away that they can be here within four minutes. We, have, we also have, and I neglected to say earlier, is that we have full-time round-the-clock um, medical care. So we have uh, two RNs on at all times, and we have uh, emergency doctors who work as our consulting physicians who are here every day as well. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so this question, Gina actually talked a little bit about when she was talking about plans and you know, and perhaps sometimes parents are really good at making sure that their child has one in a school environment, but at a camp, maybe not so much. And maybe they do have this false sense of comfort, you know, and that really they do need to trust and verify with the camp. 
So I'll ask um, both of you, Eleanor, we can start with you for Camp TAG. Does each camper um, at Camp TAG have an individualized care plan for managing that child's allergies? Yes, they do. So every camper and teen counselor as well must fill out a medical health form, uh, and it has to be signed by their board-certified allergist because of the medication. So everybody has to have a plan, and it's part of the registration packet when they register for Camp TAG. Wonderful. And Sandy, what about at Camp Wingate? Yes, we require that anyone who has who um, who has anaphylaxis that they come with their own individual um, emergency plan. Okay, thank you both. Um, okay, another question, and this, um, Sandy, you even mentioned a little bit about this when you were talking about the parents taking the child off site, you know, for activity or restaurant. But as far as camp staff taking campers off-site, does that ever happen? Are, are the campers ever taken off-site for activities? And if so, um, is there a staff or someone who would carry the epinephrine? And just in case of an emergency, how would that be handled? We do take trips out of camp um, throughout, the, throughout the summer. Um, and the state of Massachusetts requires that when you send a group of kids that there's a dedicated health supervisor so if the whole camp is going, we send several nurses with us on a group, like if we go to the water park. Um, but if it's just a, a walk down um, out of camp on a hike, um, one of the bunk counselors does always carry the EpiPen with them, or uh, carry an, the auto injector with them as well. Um, when we're going out of camp, most of the time, all of the time, we are supplying the food. So we're bringing sandwiches and snacks that we know are camp safe. We have a, a rule at camp that camp rules apply, so the kids know that if they're at the water park, they can't buy peanuts, tree nuts, sesame, because they know about the inherent risk for their friends. And we've never had a problem with that. And by bringing our own foods, we also reduce the risk as well, and being specifically able to manage the foods and provide the foods for kids with food allergies. Great, thank you. And Eleanor, how about at Camp Tag? Do the campers ever um, go off-site for activities? They don't. With it being a day camp, everything, all the activities are on site every day. So we never leave the campsite until they leave at the end of the day to go home and then return the next day. And then we also, besides the medication policy, have a food policy as well that everyone has to abide by. And all three of the campsites that we have for this summer in 2019 already have policies in place because they are peanut and tree nut free campsites already, which makes it easier for everyone as well. Agreed, agreed, thank you. And we will, we'll move on and talk about meals and food in, in one second. I just wanted to ask Gina real quick, um, because obviously at Camp Tag and Camp Wingate Kirkland, um, you both are prepared and do have policies and allow you know, children to self-carry or have the a medication so close by. But Gina, I know maybe we've heard from parents, or I know you have, that sometimes camp staff, you know, will tell them that they actually have a policy where a child can't carry their medication um, at camp. Um, do you have any advice for them? Sure. And we do still get that qu questions like that or camps that don't want to accommodate a food allergy, a serious health issue like a food allergy, is actually considered often a disability under federal laws in the United States like the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA. So camps do need, most camps do need to provide reasonable accommodations, carrying epinephrine or having an adult trained to administer epinephrine like an EpiPen or AVQ would be considered an accommodation. There are some uncommon exceptions to this. For example, a, a strictly religious camp or that doesn't get any federal funding or certain private clubs. In those cases, which are very rare, uh, they may not have to provide reasonable accommodations because ADA, the Americans Disability Act, wouldn't apply. But it's usually, when a camp refuses, in my experience, it's usually a matter of just educating the camp. So you want to handle it formally and put your request in writing if they're refusing. Sometimes we hear, like, no, our counselors can't carry the epinephrine or no, they won't administer it. So you may want to start out with a little ex uh, education. There have been cases that unfortunately have escalated. For example, there was a program in Massachusetts, um, the 
uh, young Shakespeare's Players East, and they this program did not want to accommodate a young boy with food allergy by having adults trained to recognize and treat anaphylaxis. And it e ended up escalating to the Department of Justice and the United States Department of Justice oversees the Americans with Disabilities Act. And the settlement that came down was that they, you know, the Department of Justice told this camp or this program that they needed to provide this, that this was an accommodation. And if they don't provide this additional service or accommodation for an individual with a disability, it's considered discrimination. So, and there have been other cases with camps, like there was a case that escalated to the Department of Justice and an agreement was settled with Camp Bravo, where the camp counselors needed to say that they would recognize and treat an epileptic, epileptic reaction. So there are protections, and in most cases, it's just a matter of educating because parents and camp staff need to know that food allergies are not just a medical issue, that they can be a legal issue as well. Thank you, and so good to know that there really are protections and that, you know, parents can make an effort to educate themselves and camps can do the same, so thank you. Okay, I'd love to move on and just take, take a second to talk about meals and food safety a little bit and food policy, and both of you kind of already touched on, on this before when you were answering some of your other questions, so we won't spend too much time, but um, I'll start with you, Sandy, and, and Camp Wingate Kirkland. Can you just tell us, you, you mentioned that there is a separate kitchen that you guys built, but can you just talk a little bit about, you know, food safety? So maybe, like, who prepares the food for campers and staff? You know, have they had training? Um, and then because I know you are peanut, trina, and sesame free, but for other allergens or campers that have multiple allergies, how are those meals handed, handled? Excuse me. You can just talk a little bit about that. So we have a dedicated per, a dedicated staff person in our kitchen who specifically handles all of the food allergies, and we call her our allergy specialist. So she's um, specifically um, hired to be in the kitchen and making sure that um, each individual child has an individualized menu specific to their food allergies um, so that there is no risk of cross-contamination or confusion. With the... Um, support and assistance and participation from our chef and me as well. So we really try to make campers feel like they're everyone else. So whatever the meal is, what we try and do is to make the camper's meal look like a safe version of the meal. Um, so if everyone's having, uh, let's use chicken Parmesan because it covers a lot of um, it covers a lot of allergies. It covers wheat, it covers dairy, it covers um, soy sometimes. But what the chef will try and do with, with our allergist um, assistance is to create a version of that that looks like everybody else's but is allergy free. So perhaps it won't have panko, they wouldn't use an egg wash to, to, to um, cover it, but it's all created very specially. So when it comes out, the kids don't feel like they're special because they have something different. It's developed and, and prepared in our uh, kitchen, so there is no cross-contamination. And then those campers are served on a very specific color platter tray so that when it comes out into the kitchen, it comes out into the dining hall and the campers are sitting down with their meal, it's a visual cue to the rest of our staff that knows that this child has a food allergy so that they are aware we need to make sure that campers are not spilling or being careful or not sharing with this child. It's also a cue to the kitchen staff so that when the child comes and asks for more, when they see this red tray, they know that um, they need to look, they need to go specifically to the allergy specialist to make more. So we go to great lengths to really individualize how we prepare the food specific to each camper and their specific food allergies. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and then Eleanor, uh, I know, I think you mentioned that the campers can bring their own lunch, which is awesome, but does camp, and you said camp tag now maybe has a food allergy policy in place for 2019, but you, can you talk about just in general, you know, um, how meals and snacks and food are handled at camp tag, you know, are they monitored, um, any kind of insight you'd like to provide? Yes, yeah, so we've always had a food policy. Uh, for Camp Tag, where everyone brings their own lunch every day, Monday through Thursday, and then Friday is our family day with the entire family is attending. But with the campsites that we already attend, being peanut and tree nut free, their lunches have to be free of those allergens, along with fish and shellfish. And then we do allow some allergens just 
say wheat for sandwiches, for bread, uh, but we do have restrictions which are all listed on our website as well, where we try to eliminate milk and cheese-based foods such as Cheetos, Doritos, Cheez-Its, just to minimize the risk of cross-contact and how sticky your fingers get from eating those types of foods, along with egg-based condiments. Uh, such as mayonnaise, dressings, or dips are not allowed either, so we can minimize the risk of cross-contact. Um, for our daily snacks, Enjoy Life Foods donates all of the snacks every day for each of the campers and counselors every year. They've done this going on to our ninth year. If a camper cannot have Enjoy Life food products, which some cannot due to other allergens and ingredients, then I work it out with the parent to bring a safe snack for the child that isn't going to put any of the other campers or counselors at risk. And the other thing that. why, and the other great thing about bringing your own lunch too, and we don't use the dining hall at the campsites because we have a dedicated building that is ours for the week where we conduct check-in, morning education and snacks, along with lunch, time, arts and crafts, is because we also want the kids, the campers and the counselors, to also be used to eating their lunches, but being next to other campers and counselors that might have their allergens, such as, say, wheat in bread or milk or egg in a, in a baked good, and know that it's okay. We instill in them from the first day till the end, that there is no sharing food, there is no touching anyone during snack time or lunch time. When everyone checks in in the morning, they have to use the wet ones wipes. They have to use the wet ones wipes before and after snack, before and after lunch, and any other time they feel they need to use them. But we really instill in them that this is for everyone to learn to be together, to have meals together, and that it's okay, it's going to be safe, you're going to be okay. and knock on wood, an allergic reaction is not going to happen, but to be respectful of everyone's space and needs as well for their safety. I love that. I mean, that will just help build their confidence, you know, especially even as they go into the school year, they can bring bring that confidence and, and that, you know, sense of assuredness, you know, back into the cafeteria when they go back to school. So that's great. Thank you. Um, just one more question. I think, Sandy, maybe you can answer this. It's kind of about food, and then it pertains to sleepaway camp. Do you guys allow food or snacks in the bunk or sleeping sleeping areas? Sorry, I lost the mute button. Um, we, do no allow, we, we do allow uh, parents to send um, care packages that include food, and we are very specific um, by bunk about, we, instead of saying what you can't, um, we make it really clear by saying these are the foods that are acceptable for you to send. And we certainly try and promote instead of sending food because we, we really try to take away the food focusedness of everything needs to be celebrated with a with an ice cream, you know, an ice cream surprise. We really try and really focus on the fun and rather than the food. But um, if you feel like you have to, here's a list of the things that you can send. And then what we'll do is send an email out to the families. There's a child in your camper's bunk who has life threatening allergies. These are the items that you are allowed to send. Every package is screened um, in the office before it goes into the bunks so that our staff is making sure that um, what's going into the bunks is absolutely safe. And if mom or dad do send the wrong thing, and it definitely happens, grandparents forget that kids have food allergies and they send stuff all the time, we have a, on, on hand what we call trades to make sure that whatever's going into the bunk is safe. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and I like that extra touch of communication with the families and the parents, too. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about camp fun, because that's why we all go to camp, is to have fun. Um, and then we'll wrap things up. So, um, Eleanor, I'd love to start with you and Camp Tag, um, because I just love what you've done. And you designed your camp for food allergic kids and their siblings. You know, why, and maybe you talked a little bit about this with your son and daughter, but why was it important to include siblings of kids with food allergies at your camp? So, as I said earlier, siblings are just as affected and advocate just as much for their siblings when it comes to managing food allergies and anaphylaxis on a daily basis. And I wanted them to have that camp experience together. I wanted them to 
gain independence growing up together, sharing these life experiences as well, and for all of the campers and counselors to, that attend to really gain independence and confidence that they've got this, they own it, and they can manage safely for themselves and be their best advocate ever, which is what we instill in them every day at camp during our education sessions with the teen counselors being mentors and leaders. These campers are looking up to them. That gives these teenagers a sense of confidence and independence as well and makes them feel really good about themselves. It's, it's just great for the entire family because the parents also bond during the week. Many families make a vacation out of the week and we all stay at the same hotel with kitchenettes because we need kitchens for the week. And it doesn't end at the camp day. We're all still spending time together after camp at the hotel, swimming pool. We go to dinners together. We have activities in the evenings as well uh, for bonding and socializing for the teens and the campers and the parents. Um, I usually organize a teen night, one night for the counselors and then a separate night for the campers. So they kind of have a separate uh, activities focused on them and then we also as I said we go to dinners together and organize group dinners which is really great and the other thing for the parents is that they bond with other parents during the day they're dropping everyone off at camp and then they'll go and have breakfast or coffee together or lunch and get to know other parents it's the one time a year they feel like they come together with other families that really live it and get it and something new that we've added this year for the parents is a parent education session. So at each location, there's going to be a three-hour education session on one of the mornings with a board-certified allergist, a behavioral health specialist, and our civil rights attorney, Amelia Smith, uh, to really go over the latest in food allergy research and just have an open Q&A with the allergist and then with the behavioral health specialist, just to cover emotions and self-care and bullying issues, things of that nature. And then with Amelia, our civil rights attorney, really covering civil rights in schools, knowing what the laws are and what their rights are. So we're really excited to be incorporating that initiative into Camp Tag this year. Wonderful, I love that family focus. Um, okay. Maybe one last question about Camp Fun, because I know we're perhaps running out of time. Um, we can start um, with Sandy at Camp Wingate Kirkland. Can you tell us um, just a little bit about, I mean, it looks like you all have a ton of fun there, but some of the arts and crafts or games. And um, I know the focus really isn't on food, but do you try to avoid the use of food when doing such um, crafts and projects? Absolutely. Um, our camp is the the philosophy of our campus daily choice and allowing kids to be empowered to make their own decisions and design their own summer. So every day the campers choose their activities based on their interests. And we've really gotten away from anything program wise. It's related to food uh, because of the food allergies um, and really trying to focus on other things and looking for alternative ways to do stuff so that um, kids can have the same outcome, but without having the, the fear of food. Uh, so we don't do egg tosses and we don't, um, you know, go bobbing for apples because there's so many inherent risks with that. Instead, we've been able to come up with things where everybody can participate and it can be safe and fun. Um, so we, you know, we're more focused on the athletics and the performing arts and the arts and crafts and things that are about being creative, um, using your um, imagination and um, imaginative play, tennis and archery and um we still do ceramics, obviously, and painting and drawing, but everything is very well thought out and covered to make sure that there's no risk for kids with allergies. And we go to the extra step um, to make sure that there's no allergens in the bunks. Um, and it goes, sorry about that, but to make sure that it goes beyond just the, um, the food because beauty products have it. So sunscreens and lotions and potions and shampoos and, and moisturizers. Every single thing is covered and scrutinized, and we read every label to make sure that everybody's safe. That's wonderful. Yeah, the bathroom the beauty product. Yeah. 
Yes, we do the same as well at Camp Tag because everyone is responsible for bringing their own sunscreen and everything has to be labeled and they have to make sure that they're checking the ingredients before bringing it to camp and then we check it once they get to camp as well. Great. Thank you both. You really are covering all the bases um, and there there are a lot of them to cover. So it sounds like both of you and your camps really do go the extra mile. So. I'd like to just ask one last question, if I may, and, um, you know, Sandy, we can start with you. Um, can you let us know maybe just one memory or a bit of feedback that you've gotten from a family or a camper over the years that really made you glad that you have gone that extra mile and can accommodate campers with food allergies? We, you know, obviously we get um, dozens of um, messages from parents after camp with, you know, gratitude and um, compliments about how we were able to create a, a safe and supportive environment for their child with food allergies. But I think, you know, the real testament to us, you know, is when I hear the stories of the campers who don't have food allergies and how they were able to be a change maker in their environment outside of school because they're passionate and have empathy for their friends that they're able to go out into the world and share this um, with their in their schools, in their um, baseball teams. Hearing from parents say, you know, Jack stood up for a friend who had food allergies, um, be, and it's because of everything that you're teaching him at camp. Even though he doesn't have a food allergy, he was able to make his friend feel safe. Um, and that's really what, yes, we want to create a safe place, but we also want to, we're on a campaign to teach kids to have kindness and compassion and the acceptance of those children who do have food allergies. That's awesome, thank you. And Eleanor, if I may ask you kind of the same question, if, if sure. you wouldn't mind sharing. Yeah, thank you. So like Sandy said, we, we receive a lot of gratitude every single year during the week after camp. We always receive testimonials from parents and from the campers and counselors as well on what a life-changing week it has been for them as campers and counselors, but also hearing from the parents and what a great experience it was for the parents to meet other parents of children and teens living and sharing the same life experiences and being with others who live it and get it and thanking us for keeping their children safe and that you know, we've made their dreams come true of oh, having a camp that their children and teens can go to if there's not another one in their area that they feel safe attending. So just knowing that we're bringing that type of comfort to families and their children is so meaningful beyond words. And I, I'll tell you, every single year at the end of every camp, I just get bombarded with the kids and the teens and the parents with so much gratitude and thanks that I end, I'm crying. I am crying at the end of the week because it's so hard to say goodbye. No one wants it to end because it's such a such a great week. And these the the campers and the teens they just leave empowered and just so much more confident and just having that empathy and that for the siblings that attend their empowerment and their sense of compassion for their siblings too and taking that like Sandy said taking it on beyond camp and teaching friends and family and schoolmates empathy and compassion for our children living on a daily basis with food allergies or any medical condition for that matter it's uh, it's it's very empowering for everyone Agreed. You, you said it well. Both of you did. Um, I, I am just thrilled that this opportunity exists for the many parents and families, you know, and the growing prevalence out there um, and those families that think that this is not a possibility or they're anxious about it. It's nice to know that it is. So we're going to wrap up really quickly. I just wanted to put um, up some websites for some additional information. Um, FAIR has uh, information on attending camp. Um, we go over some of the family's responsibilities, camper responsibilities, and camp staff responsibilities at that website right there. And then you can also check out Camp Tag, the Allergy Game, and Camp Wingate Kirkland um, at those two sites for some more information about their camps. 
And then again, I've said it probably a thousand times throughout this webinar, a huge thank you to our expert speakers, um, to Gina for helping hundreds of parents turn their child's camp fantasy into reality by the advice that you give, um, and to Eleanor and Sandy. This opportunity of summer camp, again, for children with food allergies is only made possible because of camp owners and directors like yourselves who really do go above and beyond to, you know, minimize risk create a safe and inclusive environment, and foster that sense of kindness and empathy that you both talked about. Um, it was a pleasure to have you all with us today, so thank you so much for joining us.